Hello, my name is Dr. Leon Creaney. I'm a consultant in sport and exercise medicine, and today I'm just going to talk through with you the uh, basic anatomy of the knee joint. So if we start with the knee here, this is the right knee, and we can see that it bends here with a hinge joint, the main bone in the leg, the tibia, uh, the fibula laterally, and then we have the femur uh, forming the thigh. Um, this is called the tibial plateau. Um, we've got the fibula head, and then if I just uh, peel this around, what we have here is the kneecap, uh, called the patella. And then we have a lateral femoral condyle and medial femoral condyle. The articular surface here of the femur is lined by articular cartilage. And we also have the articular surface, the tibial plateau, which is also lined by articular cartilage. If we move on to the ligaments, we have the medial collateral ligament which does have a superficial and deep layer, which actually communicates here with the medial meniscus. And then we have the lateral collateral ligament, which actually inserts onto the fibula head. And there is no communication between this and the uh, lateral meniscus. And then deep inside the knee joint, again, if we prise away the extensor mechanism, we can see the anterior cruciate ligament, which arises from the anterior portion of the tibial plateau and inserts posteriorly on the femur. And then we have the posterior cruciate ligament, which arises from the posterior aspect of the tibial plateau and then inserts in a more anterior position on the femur. And these different ligaments have different purposes. Their collateral ligaments are there to provide a varus and valgus stability to the knee, so they resist the various movements there. The anterior cruciate ligament, which is to resist forward translation of the tibia on the femur, like that. And the posterior cruciate ligament, which is to resist posterior translation of the tibia on the femur, like that. If we look deep inside the joint, it's difficult to see here, but we have two menisci, semicircular in nature, and they're to be the shock absorbers in the knee, and they actually prevent the two bony surfaces from uh, touching each other. The extensor mechanism is made up from the quadriceps above. Then we have the quadriceps tendon. Sat within the quadriceps tendon is a sesamoid bone known as the patella. And then this gives off the patella tendon, which eventually inserts into the tibial uh, tubercle. And that's the basic anatomy of the knee. The knee examination begins with uh, observation in standing. The first things that we can look for are the presence of an effusion. Uh, muscle wasting, we can look at the leg position, uh, see if there is any um, bow leg or knock knees, also known as genu verum, genu varus, uh, and genu valgum. And we're also looking at the foot position. Uh, in particular, we're going to look at the uh, forefoot to hind foot relationships and also look at the heel position, whether there's any inversion or eversion. We'll be able to get an initial idea if there's any uh, pain, any antalgia of the patient steps off one side compared to the other and we'll also see if there's any muscle wasting. If I could get you to turn around for me now. I'm going to ask the patient to just do a half squat for me. So they're going to bend their knees slightly and push their knees forward and we're just going to look at what happens with the heels and see if there's any pronation as we do that and come back up and then stand to face me again. And then we can also get a quick idea of the range of motion and also the proprioception in the knee. If I ask you to stand on one leg and if you can do a half squat up and down on the one leg and try and maintain good control. That's great. And we're looking to see if there's any medial sway of the knee, loss of control, and we can also look at the pelvis to see if there's any pelvic drop, pelvic or gluteal weakness. And if you do it on the opposite leg, please. That's great, okay. The next thing we do is we ask the patient to do a deep squat. This gives us a good idea of the range of motion uh, if there is a particular intra-articular pathology, this is a good screening test for that. So you get the patient to just mimic what you're doing. So if you come down into a squ deep squat position, make sure that they're on the tiptoes. And if there's any pathology in the knee, they might not be able to bend at the full way. We then do what's called a duck walk, which is a good screening test for uh, intra-articular problems, in particular meniscal tears. So a duck walk is just a few steps 
in the squat position. You could do that now. And that concludes really the uh, in standing examination and we'll then move on to examine on the couch. So we'll begin the on the couch examination with observation. Uh, again, we're looking for the presence of an effusion or swelling, any obvious deformity or muscle wasting. Before uh, actually touching the patient, we'll assess the active range of motion. So I'll just ask you to bend your knee as far as it will go. And uh, can you try and pull it into your chest? Any pain as you do that? Okay, and straighten it again for me. So we're happy that the patient's got good range of motion and uh, we're going to be confident that we can actually move the, the, the limb ourselves. So following the principle of look, feel, move, um, first of all, I'm, uh, I've completed the look, so now I'm going to palpate key anatomical areas. So if I bring the knee into slight flexion, and in this position, I'm going to palpate the bony surfaces. So just palpating the tibia, bony landmarks, fibula head. You can assess movement of the fibula head and you can palpate the other side of the tibia. Medial joint line, which you can feel all the way around and lateral joint line, which you can feel all the way around. If I bring the knee into a straightened position, I'm then going to palpate the uh, patella, patella compression for patella femoral pain, the patella tendon itself, and the fat pad, Hoffer's fat pad. And you can push down through the patella tendon to stress that as well. I'm then going to assess the lateral patella facet for pain and tenderness the medial patella facet, and then the superior portion. At this point, I can also do a sweep test to look for the presence of an effusion. Fluid that collects in the knee normally collects in the suprapatellar pouch. You can milk it from one side to the other, and where there's a divot here in the knee, if there was fluid in the knee, you would see that rise into a bulge, and then you can sweep it back to the other side as well and see the fluid move to the other side. You can also slightly bend the knee and palpate in the posterior fossa for the presence of a baker's cyst or any lumpiness. And also the hamstring tendons can be palpated as they insert onto the tibia on the medial side and onto the fibula head on the lateral side. I'm now going to move on to stress testing of the intraarticular ligaments. There's various tests for the anterior cruciate ligament. The most simple one is known as Lachman's test. You grasp the thigh with one hand and bring the knee into approximately 20 degrees of flexion. And then you grasp the tibia in the other hand and you move one back and forth against the other and see if there is any increased, any increased anterior posterior translation. To assess whether it's normal for this patient or not, you need to compare to the normal side. Uh, if there's increased translation, then that's considered abnormal. You also check for the presence of an end feel. When an anterior cruciate ligament is torn, uh, there will be increased anterior movement and also a lack of an end feel to the movement. The other way to do this test is to bend the knee just uh, into flexion. Put slight pressure on the foot as you sit down to stabilise the foot. Put your fingers uh, on the posterior aspect of the tibia and then both thumbs just on the tibial plateau as it reaches the joint line and then grasp and pull forwards. And again, feel for AP movement. Check for the presence of an end feel and compare to the normal side. That's called an anterior draw test. If you do suspect it's gone, there is a test known as a pivot shift test, which we wouldn't really recommend doing, but it can be done uh, particularly usefully uh, in the anaesthetised patient preoperatively. To differentiate between an anterior and a posterior cruciate ligament tear, you can check for the presence of a posterior sag. 
You can do it in this position in 90 degrees and you can see if there is any posterior sag of the tibia. It would appear to move backwards. But you can also assess this at 90 degrees, supporting the foot and seeing if the tibia sags backwards. That's how you differentiate between anterior and posterior draw. You would then move on to assess the collateral ligaments, medial collateral ligament, lateral collateral ligament. I tend to grasp the foot, put it between my arm and my body, and then with two hands, hold onto the tibia and apply some valgus stress to stress the MCL, see if there's any increased movement, and then just hold it in slight flexion. Make sure that you don't have rotation of the foot by locking its position and then valgus force again. And then you can do the same for the lateral collateral ligaments. Again, held in uh, extension, various force, and then in slight flexion, again, prevent rotation, and various force again. And you're checking for increased laxity, lack of end feel, comparing with the normal side. To assess the patellofemoral joint, there's various maneuvers. You've already assessed for the presence of pain on compression. Um, uh, lateral uh, patella facet tenderness, medial patella fa facet tenderness. You can assess the mobility, medialaterally and posterior superiorly. There is a test known as Clark's test, where you ask the patient to contract their quadriceps and relax. And then very slowly, because it can be painful, you resist the movement of the uh, superior translation of the patella, you contract again, and you see if that's painful, and relax. If it is painful, which it often is, you can compare it uh, to the other side. Then I'll move on to assess the menisci. We've already assessed this to some extent by doing the deep squat and duck walk test. But to do a McMurray's test, try and bend the knee all the way into deep flexion. Take it as far as you can. Grasp the foot with your hand. Externally rotate it. Put your fingers on either side of the joint line and extend. And then bring it back in and rotate out. And then you can do that in a different starting position where instead of being externally rotated, you can be internally rotated. Extend. And you can also bring that back in and rotate. And you can vary the force because you may catch the pain or feel a click in different positions. So if we look at Matt squatting here, if he does a single leg squat. If he's got left knee pain and left knee pain is brought on with that squat, we can further look at him on a decline board. So if we repeat that movement on a decline board, and range improves as it does in this case, that suggests that the calf and ankle complex is restricting some of the range of movement at the knee. If symptoms do increase with um, a squat on the decline board, then we can also look at that the fact that this exercise is further loading the patella tendon. So it can be suggestive of more patella tendon involvement in contributing to the anterior knee pain or the patellofemoral pain syndrome. Modified Thomas's test can be a useful position to look at the soft tissues around the knee and their contributions to knee pain. So in this position here, I've got the left, the right leg fixed against my hip here. We've got the pelvis here and I can bring my hand across to fix the top of the pelvis across on this left hip. The leg can then just be dropped down until you start to feel it going into resistance. And as we come to this point here, we can see if I hold on there, that we're hitting the range of limitation at Matt's hip. In this position also, I can also add on straightening out the knee and we can drop down and we can look a little bit more at the iliocerus muscle and its contribution to tightness around the hip and potentially to knee pain. We can also look at taking off what happens if we take off a little bit of tension from the ITB by going into some abduction. And you can also look at adding on a little bit more adduction, which obviously further tightens up through the outside structures of the knee. Common attributes we see with people with knee pain is that they lack control around the pelvis. And there are some exercises that are particularly useful with people 
in anterior knee pain and patellofemoral pain syndrome. So, bridging, double leg bridge. We get Matt to actually tilt his pelvis gently back into the bed and then he pushes through both heels and lifts his bottom up. We bring him up to top height, hold that position for the count of four and then slowly lower down. And that's our double leg bridge. So progressing this further, we can also move on to a single leg bridge. So again, getting Matt to tilt backwards, get him to lift up, so tightening and engaging those bottom muscles as he lifts through. He's going to hold this position and then straighten out his right knee, maintaining his hips. You can see he's just struggling a little bit on that right side to maintain his pelvic alignment. Keep that hip nice and strong, hold the position, and then we're going to bend the knee in to come back down. So we put you on your side. So a common problem we see with knee pain is weakness in the gluteus medius posterior muscle, so the muscles on the outside of the hip. And the clam is a common exercise we can use to recruit this muscle. So the starting position is the most important bit, is with lying on the side in this position, knees bent up to roughly 90 degrees, hips just off 90 degrees. And what we look for is not to make sure that they're not dropping down into the bed, that we get a little bit of movement here that I can actually place my hand underneath the hip underneath the waist. So in this position here, we're going to hold the heels together. And what I'm going to ask Matt to do is just to lift his top knee off his bottom knee, lifting up. And we're ensuring that we're not getting a rocking back at the hip here. That we're staying nice and strong through the leg. And then he slowly lowers back down. So this bit stays nice and still. There's a lift of this knee off the other knee. There's a hold at the end Thank you. as we get to the range and then a slow lowering down. And that's the clam exercise. <laughs>